It's time for the Wrestling Observer Extra. With Dave Meltzer, right here on The Law, live audio wrestling. And let's go, my now smoking with the best, the best. Welcome back. It is indeed The Law, live audio wrestling. If you want to play tight about trivia. Oh, you're going to start early. Yeah, because there's such the a delay. delay on our feed Good that idea. happened last week. Good we idea. got five calls after we went. Good idea. Call during Meltzer's segment, 1-855-591-6876. Perfect. John will then line up two players for our next segment, which will be tied about trivia. But right now, of course, it's just after midnight as we go into our second hour, and that means we're going to say hello uh, to Dave Meltzer, the editor of the Wrestling Observer. Uh, Dave, you did not see tonight's pay-per-view as of yet, correct? Correct. I'm going to actually watch it soon after we finish the show. Okay. Um, well, we did want to start anyway uh, with, of course, the unfortunate passing yeah. of Chavo Guerrero. Now, a lot of our listeners and uh, you know fans of wrestling nowadays probably simply know him as Chavo Classic with that novelty run he had in the WWE. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about his career, but I was shocked myself to hear this because I didn't realize uh, what had gone on with Chavo uh, in regards to getting the cancer. I mean, he was in the ring as as late as November yeah. of 2016, correct? And then wanted no the one end, to know about this. The end of this. November, he, worked, he was working in Japan the end of November for um, a couple of promotions in Japan, yeah. And, and then his instructions were just, he just wanted no one to know about the liver cancer. Do you know when he was diagnosed or anything? Have we found that out? My, my impression is he was diagnosed in January, but that could be wrong. But I do know, I mean, I was kind of tipped off but, and, and was told that, like, he's in hospice care and that it's going to be any day now. And this is, this is maybe a week ago, a little over a week ago. And it was, you, you know, you can't report this. He doesn't want any sympathy. He doesn't want, it. He doesn't want anyone feeling sorry for him. But, you know, he's, it's, it's about his time. And it was really shocking. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, very because, interesting. I had, just seen, I had just seen him wrestle in, in, in Japan and, you know, Chavo was a guy who was on top when I was a kid and was one of the, I don't say he was one of the first wrestlers I met, but, you know, like, I, I met him many times when he worked in San Jose and he was, you know, 10 years older than me, 11 years older than me. So it was pretty, you know, and he was, and I, I you know, I, I can't, I didn't know him well, but, you know, I did email with him back and forth and things like that. I did know him. It was pretty shocking to me. In a yeah. lot of ways. Well, talk about some of the highlights of his career, because really up here in, in our neck of the woods, even in his heyday, I mean, I, the only place I ever saw stuff with Chavo was in the wrestling magazines. We didn't get a lot of that stuff, but, you know, he had that big feud with Roddy Piper and stuff like that. So tell us a bit about his history for some of the younger listeners. Yeah, so so he, he was the son of Gory Guerrero, obviously, and he was a college wrestler, and I think he did some gymnastics, too. But as a, so so he was a, a high school teacher and a high school wrestling coach. And in 75, and he would wrestle in the off season and he would wrestle around Amarillo. I mean, not Amarillo, um, El Paso. Mm-hmm. And then in 75, he got an offer to go to Los Angeles. And he wasn't sure if he was going to take the offer because, would, you know, he'd have to give up his, his teaching job. But he figured, okay, I'll, I'll go with it. And he went to Los Angeles. And I, I really don't know the details of it, and I'm actually going to try to find out, but I mean, he was an unknown guy who came to Los Angeles, and they pushed him to the moon. I mean, as the top baby face, he got over great as a top baby face. He turned into a super worker, you know, really quick because he was so acrobatic and, and could wrestle. And he had about a five, six-year run there as the top guy in the territory, the top baby face. Roddy Piper was his main opponent. Um, there were a lot of other opponents, you know, you know, that came through with, you know, Harley Race and Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk and superstar Billy Graham and Ernie Latt. I mean, the biggest names, he, he, you know, faced them. And he was big in Japan at the same time with Fujinami as the big opponent. For right, Fujinami. right. So he had, so he was, he was one of the top guys in the business through about 1980. And then, like, from that point on, Los Angeles went down, and he never had the success anywhere else. And it was, um, it was really unfair in a lot of ways because he had the talent, but because of his size, it was always, you know, he's too small to main event. And, I mean, the thing that always frustrated me, and I know it frustrated him, was that here he proved he could main event. You know what I mean? It's like you proved you could main event. You proved you could draw. Um, you proved you could, you know, people would buy you against Superstar Graham and Ernie Ladd and, and Terry Funk. And, and, you know, not just in Los Angeles, but in Texas as well. And then when the Los Angeles run was over, it was like nobody wanted to do anything with him. So he was kind of like a mid-card guy for a while. And... um 
you know, but always a great worker. And then, they, when, you know, 84, when once 84 came and Vince, Vince McMahon expanded, it was like, you know, Chavo had a run there, but, you know, again, he was too small. So he he never had the success again. Now, do you think um, the uh, two questions here, Dave? Do you think the WWE will do anything uh, on Raw uh, tomorrow night? And would they have anything in their vast archive? Would they have any ch- old school Chavo matches? Because I would really like to see some of his his work from his heyday. Because I've never really seen much of his older matches. Yeah, you know the place to go is probably New Japan World. I've got to think they've got some of the Fujinami matches. Right, but, right. Um, as far as the Los Angeles, I don't know. You know, almost none of that stuff survived. But there is stuff that did survive that did involve Chavo. But I don't know how much there is, and I don't know if WWE has it. But I do know, I do know that there's limited stuff that does exist. Yes. Right. And do you think they'll they'll mention it tomorrow on Raw? I think so. I mean, he worked there as Chavo Classic. Yeah. And um, the Guerrero name is a famous family name. I don't know if they'll do a big video. I hope they do. But um, I think that they'll at least do the graphic. Right. They, they, they certainly should. Enough people know he he was working there. You know, whatever it was, you know, nine ten years ago. Right, right. And um, yeah, I mean, they, they should. Yeah, I would hope they do. I would. I would like to see that. I I thought that the the Chavo Classic character was exceptional yeah, when he did fun. make his return as well. Fun. It was very fun for a little while. Um, okay, Dave. So um, uh, and he could still. That's funny. Is he could he could still wrestle too. He could do that moonsault. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, and he was like sixty ish. Yeah. 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 That was insane. I just remembered him doing the moonsault. I was like, what is happening? How is this man doing this moonsault? Mm. Then again, though, that was one of his trademark moves, correct, Dave? Yeah, he may have been. I, I think that his brother Mondo may have been the first moonsault guy. But the first one I ever saw do it was Chavo. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that was before Mudo did it. Mudo was the one who obviously popularized the move. So, um, but, but yeah, I, you know, Chavo was doing all that acrobatic stuff. You know where you could see some of his stuff if you could ever find the movie The One and Only with Henry Wink? Oh, yeah, okay. Chavo, did, Chavo was in that movie as, as, as a wrestler and did a lot of acrobatic ah, stuff in that okay. movie. Him and, him, and Piper, him and Piper both were in that movie. Right, right. Well, let's flip over to what we're going to see tomorrow night on Raw, Dave. It's the Festival of Friendship, uh, which is going to be very exciting and enjoyable, of course, with those two guys. But moving on uh, down the road to the next pay-per-view. So you have Kevin Owens and Bill Goldberg. This match is now set up. Now, my question to you is, do you think, we posed this on the show earlier, do you think this match should be a classic Goldberg squash? Don't you think it has to be? I think the way that they've booked him with Lesnar, it has to be. Absolutely. Yeah, because he's main eventing WrestleMania. And, and, you know, the one thing, if you go back historically, of all the guys that Goldberg like beat in two minutes, they, they never really were off, bad off for doing it. Like, you would think, oh, my God, it kills you. But if you looked at all those guys, they were never worse off. So, I mean, and Kevin Owens can talk and Kevin yeah. Owens can work. And, and it, you know, the, the only thing is, is that you do need, if you're going to do that two-minute match again, and I think they will, you really do need like a killer match, and losing Rollins and Joe really hurts the show because to me, Rollins and Joe was that match. So now it's, um, I, you know, I don't know who who gets that match. I mean, is it Jericho and Sami Zayn? I don't know. There's got to be because because to me, if you're going to do that short main event, you have to have a killer match on the show. So people don't complain. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about Samoa Joe. I mean, I very much enjoyed the way he was presented at the beginning of the show on Raw. I was surprised to see the Joe and Reigns match already given to us at yeah. the end of the night. But now that you have Reigns and uh, Braun Strowman on the next pay-per-view, Joe seems to be lost right now. Yeah, I know, because it's, it's, it's like if you're going to put him with a baby face... I mean, who's the next? The next guy down is probably Sami Zayn, and I, I suppose you could do that match just to do it, and that actually could. Like, if you just said, "Okay, you know, you two guys, twenty-five minutes, you got to save the show," they probably will tear the house down. Mm-hmm. So that may be the way to go. But but you know, the, you, if that is the way to go, they have to they have to set it up Monday because you know it's it's cold. You know, there's it's, there's nothing to it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one other th- quick question coming out of tonight's show as well, Dave. Uh, we had the uh, title change with uh, Alexa Bliss. Naomi won the women's title. Um, was this always the long-term plan, or was this has this been tweaked recently? Because it seemed a little weird for Naomi to maybe win it so soon. I would have thought maybe Mania, since that's her hometown as well. Man, yeah, I guess the idea is they wanted her to go into Mania as champion because of it being her hometown. I was surprised, you know, because... It just felt too early for Alexa Bliss to lose mm-hmm. to me. 
um, and Mania probably would have been a better time. But, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, there's so many championships. Yeah. And it really, you know what I'm saying? It's like that championship, the timing of that championship doesn't really matter. It's the, the two big men's championships mm-hmm. that matter the most. And of the women's titles, the Raw one is really the more important of the two right now. So, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. And I guess that's the idea. It's like, well, we'll have an Orlando woman go in as champion for the local market. And, you know, yeah, why not? Oh, guys, what are we all thinking? She, it's her hometown. She's going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> that's what WWE does, know, right? Yes. Yeah, so they have done it before. Back to Alexa or, or they go to a multiple person. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, did they set up somebody for her to, to, for her to face different? Or is it, does it look like a multiple person match again? Well, they shouldn't do it. If, the, if Raw's doing a multiple-person match, SmackDown shouldn't do a multiple-person match. Right, and that match. seems to be the issue, yeah. We, uh, we've just we had were that talking whole discussion. About that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's flip over and touch on TNA. It was actually uh, an interesting week behind the scenes for TNA with the uh, with Scott Demore uh, going back to the company here. Now, you have Scott Demore, who, who when I think of Scott Demore, I think of the, the start of the knockouts division. Team Canada. Uh, how great, you know, maybe not great, but how good things were for a little while in TNA. Along with that, Dutch Mantel, Jeff Jarrett, all of these guys involved in the next tapings that start uh, March the 2nd. Uh, I don't know. Can, can you say positive, Dave? Is that possible to talk about TNA in that respect? Well, it's more positive than before. But, you know, it's just the problem is, is that it would have been if, if this move was going to be made, it would have been so much better if they made the move two years ago when they were still on Spike. Mm-hmm. Because they have just lost so much popularity and so much momentum that you're starting at a real low point. Um, and also, they don't have a ton of talent, and, 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 and that's also an issue. Uh, the, the one thing, and, and, and there's not, like, like when, when those guys were there before, I mean, there was a lot of talent that Scott knew. You know, there was a lot of that hidden, undiscovered talent, like the Eric Youngs and the Bobby yeah, Roos and people yeah, like that got yeah. their break. And it's like, there are there is a ton of talent out there, but... Most of them, you know, WWE's got their eyes on most of them, and a lot of the other ones are under contract to ROH, Revolve. So it's it's like it's it's like there's not like these great workers out there that Scott can bring in that he knows that he trained that no one knows about. I mean, it's like I, as far as I know, unless there's some he's got some secret guys up in in, in the Windsor that I don't know. But so the, the situation is very different from them. The one thing about Scott that was was so much better than when Scott wasn't there was the pay-per-view shows because Scott, and he wasn't the only one, but Scott had that understanding of, I put this guy against this guy and have it go this long, I'm going to have a really good match. If I put this guy against this guy, it's going to suck, so I'm not going to do it. Whereas the people who followed him, they just put people against right. people. Right, yeah. And just, you know, it's like if it was good, it was good. If it was bad, it was bad. But they didn't know ahead of time, and so you didn't. Like with Scott, you had really a lot of great pay per view shows. I mean, remember that run where TNA was always great pay per view shows. Yeah, yeah. And so, then you know, afterwards TNA was like everybody else; it was hit and miss. So, so having said that, do you expect some major creative shakeups when they do this next set of tapings in March? Do we see like kind of sweep the, the 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 canvas clean and start fresh, or will they just kind of ease it in slowly? I think it, it'll be eased in slowly as far as changes. I mean, I wish that they could do the big change, like change of location. You know what I mean? Like kind yeah. of like a, a, a reimage. A yeah. But, um, you know, but it's, it's almost impossible to do. You're going to be in the same place. You're going to have the same cast of characters. Um, you know, I think that we'll have different storylines and stuff, but it's still the same people. So it's it's. Um, it's it's going to be tough. Well, will I'll it be the will it be the same people? Because some of these people, Drew Galloway, the Hardys. I mean, some of these guys are coming up on the ends of their contracts. Will uh, they, they be are. able to they're afford? They're will they be able to afford to keep some of these people? That's a good question. You know, I, and again, I don't know what the finances are. I don't know what everyone's willing to spend. Um, I think we're going to know. You know, in the next, I think the next these two things are going to be very very interesting. Um, and again. And 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 is the situation with Galloway and the Hardys? I mean, that's going to say a lot because I think in both, you know, losing Galloway wouldn't be good, um, but it won't be a killer. But losing the Hardys is kind of like that. The, you know, Matt Hardy and the, the Hardys right now are kind of like the one identifying part of yep. TNA. To yep. Lose them, that would feel like a big step back. I think. Dave, yep, he's got to so say too. goodbye for this week. Um, will you have uh, Chavo in the Observer? Yeah, I should have a story on Chavo. Should have a big business story um, on WWE. Actually, I've done that story and it's very detailed. 
on you know just their whole their year business, what to look for, what to, what what ideas there are coming forward uh, in the future. Chavo Guerrero coverage of uh, you know the New Japan show and the UFC show and tonight show and whatever it breaks on Monday and Tuesday and uh, yeah that would be that would be it. Sounds good, Dave. Well, enjoy a very well paced elimination chamber match tonight. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, all right, talk Have to you next week. week. You too, Dave Meltzer. WrestlingObserver.com is where you can find his work.